Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley Network webinar series. My name is Andrew Harvey, and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Julie Taylor. Julie is a faculty member of the World Arts Department of Dallas International University, where she is a joint head of the MA courses in advanced analysis and research methodology for a large part of each year. In 1993, she began work with SIL as an ethnomusicology and anthropology consultant with 25 years of coordinating this work across Africa. In 2002, she was awarded her PhD by the University of Edinburgh on epistemology shaping musical change in the traditional music system of the Sabao in Kenya. This included a sizable transcription portfolio of their songs of that time, juxtaposed with examples demonstrating external musical influences of belief systems and popular media. In 2018, Julie switched continents and now continues as an ethno arts consultant with language projects in Eurasia. Please join me in welcoming Julie as she gives her talk, Interrelationships Between Ethnomusicology and Linguistics, with examples from the wider Rift Valley region. Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you, and hello to everyone. It's good to be with you today, and thank you for that kind introduction and also for inviting me today. First of all, the usual disclaimer, I need to make it very clear. I'm not a linguist, but I'm an ethnomusicologist. Um, but I was able to study in Chicago and then do field work in Papua New Guinea with the linguist and ethnomusicologist Bida Chenoweth, which gave me a practical hands-on experience of the approach that I'll be outlining today. I was initially asked to share with you about the music of the Sundawe, but my time with them was rather brief and certainly insufficient to make more than generalized statements. And because of that, I'm going to draw examples from two other locations and only briefly mention Sundawe. Most of the data used today will be from the Sabot people who live on the eastern slopes of Mount Elgin and were the focus of my PhD research in the late 90s. Mount Elgin is the fourth highest mountain in East Africa after Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya, the Ruizoris, and it straddles the border between Kenya and Uganda, overlooking the, the Eastern Rift Valley. And it was the opening slide picture. As a language, Sabot is approaching EGIDS level four as it's now taught in public primary schools in the region. It has a long classification heritage ranging from Nilo-Saharan down to Kalenjin and is related to Kupsabini or Sebe, which is spoken on the Uganda side of Mount Elgin. Sandawe, as you will all know, is a Khoisan language isolate in the Dodoma region, rated as vigorous and used orally by all generations. The third group, is the Sangu in the southwest of Tanzania, Nambea, who are decreasing in number and were recently reassessed and threatened as threatened and vulnerable. Family level transmission of Shisangu and cultural practices is decreasing, perhaps due to the pressure of sharing their land with 19 other tribes. Their language is part of the Bantu Central Languages G61 group. I thought you might find an introduction to ethnomusicology interesting, how the domain began, what has characterized its stages of development, and how it has intersected with linguistics. I should start by saying that trying to define ethnomusicology is like trying to say what color a chameleon is. In nearly 140 years, no single definition has emerged that satisfies everyone but the numerous attempts at least show it to be a discipline full of curiosity and reflective of changing times. So setting the scene, um, I'll start with pre 20th century evolutionism. The rise of Darwinism was the progression from savagery to barbarism to civilization. 
It was thought that all species are related, all gradually change over time, all follow the same path. Primitive societies were considered a window to the origins of European culture, and most of the research done at this time was from an armchair. But then comes the thought that societies might reach the same level of cultural development through different paths. The arrival of particularism and early comparative musicology. Particularists studied individual cultures, they became anti-theoretical and they demanded detailed data. Early birth pains of a more relativistic approach to music and it led to um, a new term, Kulturkreis, which translates as culture circles, as the idea that um, transmission of culture contact would share ideas and in music would share concepts of genres. And a growing interest in similarities was developing between and among cultures. There was a rapid increase in culture mapping and geographical trait listings. And part of this was the emergence of cantometrics, of which I'll say more in a minute. Um, there's a growing focus on preservation of culture and music systems, which became known as salvage ethnology, save it before it's lost. People were leaving armchairs to make the first field recordings of music, creating archives, cataloging recordings, endless transcriptions, it was a time of scientific, systematic study of scales, tuning, sound textures such as heterophony and musical instruments. We had the emergence of the classification system created by Sax Hornbostel, which is still used today. And there was a growing interest in studying the other or non-Western musics and a first attempt at developing a name, musicology. I'll unpack, unpack two examples from this list. The first is um, culture mapping, and this is taken from a, uh, a book that Lomax published in 1980, and he was attempting to create a cantometric map of world song styles. So he considered 148 song style regions based on analysis of cantometric codings of 1,800 traditional folk songs. It was a project that inevitably relied on generalizations and it drew criticism from many quarters. It was felt Lomax was more interested in improving, in improving cross-cultural unity at high levels of organizational complexity and in so doing was ignoring the real features of musical events at grassroots level. Also, that such an approach was retrogressive. It was um, encouraging a return to considering folk music to be the product of bounded places and static communities. The second example is a particularist you may have heard of, Bella Bartok, a composer, folklorist and pianist. This is a sample field transcription he researched Hungarian and Romanian folk music primarily, and his descriptions uh, and transcriptions were extremely detailed. Every ornament was written out, um, little notes written above and below, and he filled endless books of jotting these down live in the field. Um, to his credit, he integrated a lot of these melodies and characteristics into almost all his compositions. But it's led to a debate that continues to this day, should transcriptions capture prescriptive or descriptive performance? We then move to the 60s to the 80s, that period of 20 years, and we begin to see intersections with anthropology. Um, that meaningful sound is created with a specific cultural context and also with ethnology, the comparative study of different cultures. And finally, we see a definition of ethnomusicology 
that most remain happy with the study of music in its social and cultural contexts. In other words, music is no longer considered an isolated object of study, but it's part of a dynamic process affected by the community within which it's situated. And a big proponent of thought in anthro and music circles of this time was Alan Miriam. During this period, the emphasis was on interpretation, meanings of symbols and emotions, performance, what happened in a performance, how to capture it, thick description, complexity, awareness of reflexivity of the researcher themselves and how, how to deal with that in their research notes, expressivity, emotions, things that hadn't been acknowledged previously, treating informers as individuals, as colleagues, and a dialogue between widening domains. More excitingly, we see the studied becoming the teachers, and a famous example in Africa is Dr. Kwabina Nkatia, who um, hails from Ghana, was taught, he taught at UCLA, and is considered the foremost African ethnomusicologist today, author of The Music of Africa. And now, ethnomusicology meets linguistics from the 60s to the 80s. Discus discussions in the 60s were beginning on a potential relationship between phonemic tone and interval direction or cross-disciplinary applications involving linguistics and music. Important names included Noam Chomsky, who was the author of Syntactic Structures, and the ethnomusicologist Bruna Nettle, who was the chair of the Society of Ethnomusicology. Chomsky introduced the term generative, the idea that grammar could be defined as a set of formal structural rules capable of being tested by reconstitution. Um, when I studied linguistics, um, that was the form of grammar that we were working on at that time. The linguist Kenneth Pike looked at Chomsky's model and soon after, linguist ethnomusicologist Vida Chenoweth adopted Mike Pike's theories for her work in Papua New Guinea. And she published two books, Melodic Perception and Analysis and The Music of the Usarufus. The following is um, an outline of Chenoweth's approach with as many examples as we can probably cover in the time we have today. We start analysis um, with etic transcription. And here we see the transcribing of multiple examples of songs which are suspected to be of the same genre and sonogram charting which looks fantastic is actually only brought out for intervals that are really difficult um, to hear or maybe unexpected just don't seem to fit the pattern that you're hearing or seeing on paper um, it's more commonly used for instrumental um, pitches because singers tend not to keep absolute pitch so the next step is to then chart the predominant intervals that occur in the transcription or in each transcription. So at this point, we're looking for the frequency occurrences of each pitch. In Chenoweth's day, this was done by hand using a chart with preceding intervals listed on the left and following intervals listed on the top. And it could be read as follows, and I'll use the second interval on the left which is um, a minor second descending. So the way it's done, as you say, a minor second descending is followed by a minor second ascending or a major second descending or a minor third ascending and so forth. And you go through and put a little mark for the number of times you find that in that particular song. Any intervals of rare occurrence need subsequent checking as they may be a variant of another interval, an allophone or um, a pitch phoneme. 
Um, etic variants are not normally an accepted part of a scale or a pitch sequence, so it's really important to identify them. The rest on the chart, which has got a little asterisk top, um, marks the beginning and end of a song. So you could read, for example, a rest is followed by a major second ascending. And then when you look at the count um, number of hits in each box, you begin to get a sense of where the tonal center might be um, and its position, perhaps within phrases. Um, maybe it's coming at the start, maybe it's coming at the end. It's not clear on this chart, so more comparisons are needed. The next stage is analyzing the intervals between pitches as the minimal units of study, which is again similar to phonemes. So the first transcription of a song is always etic, and it's usually notated in a way that is familiar to the transcriber from outside the culture. And the transcriber will use the notation forms and the concepts of what constitutes an interval um, as they have been taught in their own culture. Um, and in this example, only the outsider would observe that the opening third is um, either minor or major. And in this case, the insider has always viewed them as the same. And later on in Chenoweth's analysis, she proves this. So the bottom version is the emic. And if you were then retranscribing your song, you would write it as per the bottom line. Chenoweth, um, based on Pike, drew up a number of what she called basic tenets for separating etic units from emic. Um, so again, etic is what is perceived and emic is what is conceived. And the first one we have here, I think I'm on the right slide here, is two similar units which are found in contrast in identical environments, and we're looking at intervals rather than pitches, are two separate emic units. So we see um, on the left hand side, we see the D down to C sharp down to B. Um, so C sharp to B is a major second descending, then it rises a minor second, then it drops a minor second. And the example on the right, we see the major second descending, but then it rises a minor third instead of a minor second, but then drops a minor second descending. So it's considered that these are found in contrast in identical environments. Another enic uh, tenet is that two similar etic units are found in conditioned or restricted fluctuation where the two are mutually substitutable for each other under certain conditions and where the two do not contrast in any circumstance and are variants of a single emic unit. This particular example, um, again I've pulled it from Chenoweth's book, only occurs in the environment of an initial phrase and the two do not contrast anywhere else in the data. So a diminished fifth at the start, so shown on the left, the B up to an F, um, is interpreted as a variant of a perfect fourth, which we see on the right, a C up to F. They might also be the result of initial pitch instability. So that needs to be tested later. Um, another tenet, two similar etic units found in conditioned restricted fluctuation where the two are mutually substitutable for each other under certain conditions and where the two are found in contrast elsewhere become two separate emic units despite the fluctuation. In this case where you see the little brackets um, 
we have a minor second descending, which fluctuates with a major second descending. Um, and Chenoweth reasoned that this fluctuation was conditioned by rhythm, and she said it was common due to its weak rhythmic position and the rapidity with which it's sung, it tends to be unstable or unstable in pitch. Um, and she also found in stronger rhythmic positions, there was contrast between a minor second and a major second. There are many more tenets, but I think you have enough here to see the way that this is going. So I won't burden you with more. The next step is to begin charting the interval progressions of what you believe to be Enoch units um, in each song using, in this example, a tonal formula tree diagram. And um, it basically shows the allowable sequential movements of Enoch pitches that a singer can use. So we are moving towards the generative theory now. There are several ways that this can be done. Um, and so this is the first one, and it's taken from the vocal line of a circumcision song. And the circled pitch at the top, the major second um, high, means above the tonal center, H, means above the TC, which is the tonal center. Um, that is the starting point for the two potential sequences that the singer might take. Um, if the singer takes the left side, they have a choice when they get down to the bottom to jump to the tonal center and then go down or take a little detour again to the right across to the minor third lower below the tonal center. Um, so it's, it's a rather incomplete way of knowing what happens in a song, but it's the first guess. And X at the bottom of the, the line on the right is the end of the song. I recently reviewed a paper on etic emic analysis in which the author came up with a different uh, layout for succession, succession charting. He used a pie chart, which I think was rather cool. Um, just thinking about the time, I won't read out this, but it's something you can go back and look at later. And it's actually a very simple way of figuring out how a song could go if you like pie charts. Another variant is called an intervallic flow chart. Um, it's an alternative to a tree diagram and it shows a serial arrangement of intervals and their functional relationships to each other and the tonal center. The charting includes phrase boundaries, um, which are the dotted lines and intervals expressed as higher or lower than the tonal center and intervals which are final or initial. It's pretty self-explanatory if you like those sorts of things. They're great fun to make. And then to conclude, these are the four essential steps which Chenoweth says have to be present in this form of analysis. First of all, you have to summarize the intervallic syntax expressed in emic intervals including statistics demonstrating the prevalence and versatility of intervals. Second, you have to describe the tonality and syntactic relationship between the tonal center and other intervals. Then you describe the melodic structural features, phrasing, melodic contour, rhythm and form, which I won't go into today, but um, you can find all of that in her book. And then also, to close, you can summarize the genres of similar structure within the musical system. There are other lexical elements that need to be considered in song texts. And um, with Usarufa, which was Chenoweth's language, um, she said that um, phonological, the phonological word was the rhythmic unit. And all words tend to be spoken an equal amount of time. And the more I looked at Sabot, I began to realize that that was the case. 
and I've got a very, very short example to play you of a song. So from that, you can get the sense of the rhythm of the chick, 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 um, going on in the, the bass line, which is uh, just a block of wood with a couple of beaters. You get the, the rhythm in the um, lyre, and then you get the vocalist trying to fit a lot of syllables into the time that he has. Um, and when I first started analyzing and, and transcribing this music, I began to think maybe he was just desperately trying to fit it all in because he'd forgotten how long the phrase lengths were. But uh, eventually it became very clear that um, there was meaning in, in the reason why he was doing this. Um, so we have the phonological word as a rhythmic unit. Another interesting thing in Sabot is vowel lengths. And this would be for any language, is to think whether there's differentiation between short and long. In Sabot, it's quite extreme. Um, we have karam, which is just water. Um, we have karam, which is good. Karam is I fetched water. And then karam is wasp, which is a shortened version. And then Sabot also has light and heavy vowels produced by advanced ATR. Um, so we have tib and then we have teb. And the question immediately is, how does all of that impact the mel melodic line? And it's interesting to see again that it doesn't. In some language groups, it does extremely. Um, it matches um, syllable for syllable, matches um, of the, mel of the um, melodic tone, matches the lexical tone. Um, but not in Sabot and obviously not in Nusarufa. Um, and likewise, the lexical tone in Sabot, they have three tones, low, medium, high. Um, and again, they don't seem to influence choice of pitch. And so meaning in songs is invariably inferred from the context, um, which is also the case in some of the stories that they tell, so when they're very fast, as in sung epics. Um, there's other elements that need to be thought about, the use of vocables or other sounds, um, very significant in many languages, particularly Sabot, um, and they sometimes comprise entire response sections in a song. And certain performers will have their own stylistic markers, the way they use the vocables, and they can be used for emphasis or emotivus, motiveness, and they can be used to extend a phrase to fit with the underlying rhythmical structure. And a very short example here of a song called Melilto um, from Sabot, which is a post-circumcision song about a leopard. <laughs> And then we also have to look for words that have been shortened to fit phrase lengths. And um, there's an example of ketit and ket, um, which mean the same thing, but um, you get both versions in a song. I've got my cat jumping all over my table here. Thinking about applications of this form of analysis today, um, to be truthful, this is seldom used in its entirety for several reasons. First of all, data can be difficult to find. Um, collecting data of traditional songs requires a lot of time and more importantly, uh, a considerable element of trust. And um, if you're just going in short visits to a group, it isn't possible. So it's, it's best done by people who are resident ethnomusicologists. Um, and another problem is that music systems today are rapidly changing. Um, the, Klim the Klimt analysis of Sangu shows that Western diatonic scales are now 
becoming the norm for um, the uh, Vigoma songs. And in the case of Sabot, we have two music systems side by side. We have pentatonic and diatonic, depending on what song they're singing. And that is also the case among the Sandawe. Um, whereas amongst the Sangu, it seems to be, um, at least with this particular genre that uh, Daniel Klimt is studying, it seems to be um, integrated. And then again, the analysis itself is very lengthy and there has to be a very good reason for doing it. Um, and it needs to be about much more than just preservation and archiving. And this is really the main reason why analysis of this nature has not been done with Sandawe or its neighboring language groups at this point. Um, I did make several short visits to the Sandawe region from 2004 onwards, but I was unable to stay for sufficient time to collect enough examples of song genres. But what does stand out from um, that time when I went for a songwriting workshop in Magambua in 2005, I was fortunate to have the company of linguist Helen Eaton, who is with us today. Um, and she joined me in the recording booth for a final check of the words of every new song as it was being sung. All was going smoothly. We had almost completed recording um, two verses from Psalm 119, verses 9 and 11, when Helen suddenly leapt to her feet. And what the soloist had intended to sing, and I looked up my recording notes, was, I will follow your word. Um, but the slightest of slips, and I don't know if it was a prefix or suffix, Helen will know, um, resulted in, he will follow your word. So all was duly corrected, but it highlighted for me that the importance of working along linguists and translators is that we can learn so much from each other and avoid little mistakes like this creeping in. A big discussion today in ethnomusicology is stability and malleability. In the case of the Sangu, Vigoma, over the last 40 or so years, um, Sangu youth appear to have lost interest and generational or family transmission of Vigoma has ceased. Older artists blame lack of motivation in the youth. And as soon as I read that, I had to laugh because it's an accusation I've heard virtually everywhere. I also hear it among the Sandawe and the Sabot. Um, and I'm not sure that that is actually the real truth of the matter. With the help of those who can still perform it, Klimt has used the Chenoweth analysis method to ascertain which features of Vigoma are stable and which can be malleable yet still perceived as real Sangu Vigoma. In seeking answers to what might encourage existing artists to pass their skills to the next generation and what might stir interest among the youth, he is now engaged in a very exciting project that will take live performances of Vigoma across the Sangu region, as well as eventually creating a film documentary of the process. So in closing, there will always be a place for this linguistic based approach to musical analysis and historical archiving of outcomes. But most ethnomusicologists are moving from what they consider to be a decontextualized analysis of musical structure to more ethnographic approaches that determine the situated meanings and values of music within performance contexts. And a growing feeling is that ensuring revitalization of cultural music has to be in the hands of its practitioners. Um, and if a culture dies, we have to live with it um, rather than inter intervene. So I shall stop at that point and thank you very much for listening. And if you've got questions, fire away. Well, thank you for this, Julie. And once again, if 
anyone has a question, they can raise their hand and I will send a request to unmute. Or alternatively, you can type your question into the chat um, and I'll read it. Uh, and please remember that the webinars are recorded and the recording will be released on YouTube. Um, I'll uh, use my uh, prerogative as, as, uh, as host to ask a first question, uh, Julie. You'd mentioned sort of the long-term uh, nature uh, and also sort of the, the very sort of labor intensive and specialist nature of uh, collecting the data that you need in order to do these analyses. And I was wondering, um, first of all, I mean, it seems, it seems like there are so many um, links between the kind of work that you're doing and the kind of work that linguists are doing. I, I'm sure that even mm -hmm. if uh, our people in uh, the audience couldn't read musical notation, a lot of the concepts were very sort of familiar. And um, I'm wondering, sort of as somebody who does uh, language documentation, who goes out with a recording device and a camera, et cetera, and who is sometimes offered to, uh, you know, record music, for example, or songs, you know, we're, we're always sort of encouraged from a documentary perspective to make recordings that are usable for multiple disciplines or sub-disciplines, including musicologists. And I was wondering what in your mind would constitute usable data for a musicologist, which might be reasonably recorded by, you know, somebody like me. So sorry, what was the question? I'm wondering, <laughs> I was really no worries. Bonnie sense. <laughs> um, I'm wondering sort of what kind of data a linguist might record that, that a musicologist would find, would, would find useful. Right. Um, I think tone is the big thing. Okay. Um, over and over again, I come up with problems of what to do with tone and whether um, it is causing problems uh, with with um, subsequent songs um, if we if we break rules about tone. Um, I worked for a brief time with Connie Kuchlozhenka and in DRC and. She was working with a language at the time which mirrored tone exactly. Um, and I have transcriptions where the melodic line exactly moves with the tone and it's only pentatonic. So there weren't a lot of choices of what you could do. I think she had five tones, I may be wrong. Um, and yet it was still possible to achieve. And I've not come ac across that. In fact, I often find the opposite that when people are singing, they tend to ignore tone and I'm wondering if that's partly a damage problem caused by poor translations of hymns earlier where tone was ignored and people got used to making to to singing that things that they knew were wrong but overriding them mentally in their minds and just sort of telling someone next to them that you know this is meant to mean this <laughs> so um I think that's really helpful. And then also, I think with with discussions um, on maybe the best people to ask, uh, the people that know um, the purest dialect or examples of speech um, are likely to be probably the most um, informed with the types of traditional songs. And if they don't sing them themselves, they will know more about what is right and what is wrong about the recording that's been made. So I think those sort of crossover points are really helpful. Okay, uh, thank you. And I see that Bonnie has a, uh, a comment that's probably related um, to what you uh, had just addressed, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll mention it. And if you have more to say about it, um, uh, Bonnie says that Sabot and some other Nilotic languages are cross-linguistically exceptional in having extra long syllables. Does this make their musical phrasing also cross-linguistically exceptional? Bonnie, are you referring to the number of syllables or the length of the syllables? The length of the syllables. Yeah, yeah, Don't we have- too long. Yeah, we have, um, they use a Mora system in Sabots and 
it, that's in the speech, but in song they don't. And immediately I was thinking, how on earth do they know the meaning when it's they have so many variants of long and short vowels and heavy and light vowels. Um, and then um, they also have grammatical features that have to be shown. Um, yeah, it's very, very, very complex. 16, I think they have 16 vowels. And um, yet singers seem to gloss over it. I kind of just have to step back and let them do it. I can't um, say, sorry, this is wrong. Um, it's it's for them to decide. Uh, but I think if in the case of we, if we come across something that's poorly translated and the meaning is obviously wrong, then we, we could say something. But um, generally we step back and don't. Or we leave it to the linguists. <laughs> I see Helen has her hand up. Let me ask her to unmute. There we go. Thanks. Yeah, um, it's very interesting just thinking here about um, in the languages I know, vowel length is really crucial. So it's a bit like tone in that there are lots of minimal pairs to do with vowel length. And it, it has occurred to me, you know, in songs, how does that work? So I'm guessing it's probably they could go either two ways, the same as with tone, that they do follow it or that they don't in the rhythm. And Sangu is one of them. So I don't know if the person that you've mentioned, Daniel Klimt, who works here with me as well, um, that you know whether he's looked at that. Because um, I, I've i also had the experience with Bena, which is another language near and bare, it's quite similar to Sangu, where... Um, the, some people wanted to write a, they, they had a quite an old Bena songbook, which is um, hymns translated into Bena rather than their own songs. And they're very reluctant to write long vowels, which are in their new orthography, but weren't in their old orthography, because they felt it would mess people up when they sang them. So it's something that comes up a bit here. I'm curious if you've had experience of people with, um, I mean, it's similar to long syllables, I guess, but um, yeah, just when vowel length is is so crucial. I mean, Sango only has five vowels, so there's a lot going on with vowel length. Yeah, and it's also relating to Bonnie's question that's just gone up about um, advanced ATR. Um, it seems like sometimes they will use um, falling falling tones to em emphasize a stress. Um, and that, particularly in ATR, um, they will put an accent on a particular part of the word that shows that that is part of a ATR system there. Um, with the vowel lengths, I think if a song is very slow um, and they have obviously have time then to replicate exactly the way it should be in discourse, that's that's not a problem. It's when they sing extremely fast, like that first example I played you, where um, the singer is telling a very, very long story that goes on for a good 45 minutes um, and has so much text to get get out or story story material. Um, and that's where, you know, where the sort of um, the word pattern becomes very important rather than the actual syllables themselves fitting with the rhythm, yeah. Bonnie asks, how is ATR reflected in, in the song? So you, you, you mentioned it quickly, but this idea between sort of the, I think you, you were saying heavy and light um, vowels, are, are, they, are they differentiated in the songs or are they, are, they, um, are they often, you know, pronounced in one way? I'm, yeah, I'm interested. Yeah, I think I think more research needs to be done on this. Um, my research was primarily on the music system rather than the linguistic one. So um, there are a lot of questions still sitting there that need to be sorted at some point, And that's on the list for later. But um, the, the few examples that I can see and you have to work with um, someone um, who has got the time and the patience to sit with you and go through every single 
translation word by word and just match it with the way they sing it. Um, so it could take hours just to do one song with that sort of detail. Um, but yeah, the, apart from what I've said about the way ATR seems to be shown, I can't add any more at this point. I see Helen has her hand up. Go ahead, Helen. Thank you. Yeah, I just wondered, um, I know that you've been involved in recording songs, traditional songs, songs that already exist, but also in song workshops like the one with the Sandawi, mm. where people are creating their own songs, but using their own styles, obviously. Yeah. So do you, do you often see that, um, that people create songs differently? in different styles to the ones they use when, when they sing you something more traditional? Do some, do some people do very much the same kind of thing again? Or, I mean, I suppose maybe with the, the Sangu work, it sounds like other influences are coming in. So newer songs are different than older songs. But, I mean, to me, just in memory from 15, yeah. 16 years ago, <laughs> um, I remember thinking that the Sandawi songs sounded nothing like Swahili um, uh, choruses that you, you heard in church. So it never felt to me like they were copying the, the Swahili style, but obviously that was just my non-expert ear thinking that. So, Yeah, I, I'm allergic to Swahili style, so it's <laughs> I go into convulsions as soon as I hear it. Um, very interesting question, really. I think when in a workshop where you're discussing all the genres that they have, that they still remember, that they still use. They have this material all percolating through their minds that it's fresh for them. Lots of memories, lots of discussions breaking out about, oh, I remember doing this. Oh, I haven't sung this for ages. Oh, can I find that instrument? Yeah, it's over there. Let's dig it out. Um, a huge excitement at having the opportunity to revisit things that maybe have just been pushed out of their life. Um, that happens with all of us. Um, so that tends to help um, the songs that emerge then if they decide that a particular genre is a suitable um, uh, genre for a particular message, then they will keep it pretty close to the style of that genre. Um, so, I mean, a very simplistic example was be like the Sabot have... Um, warrior songs that the government has actually banned because they were too effective. But they had a warrior group on the mountain um, who would go around and just sing quietly among themselves, really. <laughs> but they used spears sort of fashioned out of just long sticks. They weren't real spears. Um, and the government thought this was um, very you know, likely to incite violence. So that was the end of that. But those songs, um, are just totally different to any other song that's sung on the mountain. So that's why I wanted to analyze every single genre that exists on that mountain, just to get a, um, a collection. Again, another archive sitting there um, in, in the Kenya government archives of something that's, it's absolutely fantastic, but would every, would anybody ever want to use it? It has to be, it has to be humans to humans talking, doing it, living it, um, not sort of putting it on paper and then sticking it away in a building. So that has always been the frustration. Um, we do it because we have to capture this stuff. Um, and historically, it's probably right. But um, on a personal nature, one musician to another, it's so much better to be actually living it and thinking whether this could actually grow new legs and could it be more meaningful in the society. And this is what Daniel Klimt is, I think, trying to do with Vigoma. And it remains to be seen whether it works or not. So watch that space, yeah. Brilliant. Um, I see Bonnie has another uh, question or comment in the chat. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh... I'll sneak in before that though. I'm, I'm interested in these workshops. Um, I, I'm interested in like, what, what do they look like? How do you, how do you go about, you know, getting the, the people that you want in the room? What sort of questions would you ask them to go about 
figuring out these different types of, of, of genres, right. how do you get people talking and thinking in those terms? Like, what, what do you, are there sort of metaphors that you use? Are there standardized questions? Like, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging because uh, a lot of African cultures, it, it, group discussion is um, not something that's usually done when you have an outsider standing at the top. They just want you to tell them what to do. And I'm not wanting to do that. So um, over the years, I've changed my teaching approach quite a lot. And I will toss in a few things to get things going. I always start with a with trying to remind them of what they have in their culture and getting them to dig deep and think about things that maybe they heard their father and their mother sing or their grandparents um, and, you know, what's missing. Um, and then also later on to reflect on what new styles are coming in and what do they see as being different between the old and the new. Um, and then, you know, all of that could take days and days of just looking at that. And then we dig out the artifacts that go with songs and whether those are still there and what sort of ceremonies do they still practice where songs are absolutely essential, the ceremony couldn't happen. And circumcision among the Sabbat is, is probably the best example. It goes on for three, four months, and every single stage has its own songs. And all the songs are different, but they're just for that one particular, like pre-circumcision or immediately after, or the recovery phase, or when you go down to the river to chill out phase, or you know, there's all of these elements of the ceremony have got their own songs. And um, they're all different genres, really. Yeah, they all come under the same label. But anyway, um, and then a discussion on what do they want to sing about? Um, quite often when, I, when I'm asked to do a workshop, I'm given a theme or told to do, um, maybe it's for a local church, maybe they're wanting to develop some sort of local liturgy or worship <coughs> that's in their own language but is also um, considered cultural as opposed to what has been brought in. That is tricky because hymnody has now been absorbed hugely into African culture. And this partly addresses Bonnie's question um, to the point that I meet people who will say a hymn that I know came from Germany or somewhere in Europe. They will say, no, that is, that is our hymn. We created that. I'm not going to argue with that. It just shows that it has been absorbed into their culture. Um, but the, what makes it difficult now for analysis is untangling the impact that has on how to define what is emic and what is etic. Um, Daniel Klimt with Sangu, when he was looking at the scale, he ended up with a diatonic scale, almost a chromatic scale at some points. And among the sabot in the traditional music, nope, it's all pentatonic, sometimes hexatonic. But even when they hear the extra note at the top, they they hear it as pentatonic. They don't acknowledge that it's an X. So in other words, it's emic, um, possible, but probably etic. So, yeah, it's... Um, it's just different ways of, of different levels. Where are people at in um, absorbing all the things that are coming in all around them? With music, often in some some locations, they are very, very, especially if there's a lot of teenagers, that sort of age group, very keen to imitate everything they hear on the radio or the TV. And of course, all of that immediately impacts whatever they're doing locally. And the guitar, of course, when that hit Africa, um, was just, I mean, just chalk and cheese. What do you do with something that's tuned diatonically um, and is now encountering instruments that are tuned to pentatonic? So all sorts of little things happen. People were tuning the guitar to be pentatonic or tuning the other pentatonics to be the, the guitar. Um, so I've got examples of that. Um, just interesting to see the dialogue that's going on there. So the second, third picture, I think I showed right at the beginning of the two people with their homemade instruments. 
that is a duo that I'm still in touch with today um, who were experimenting with tuning and trying to see if they could play the two instruments together and what they could make of, of that in a song. Yeah. Brilliant. That's really uh, fascinating, Julie. I, I see Bonnie has a uh, final comment. She, she brings up uh, this uh, master's uh, dissertation by Godsey uh, at uh, UCLA Musical Form in Sandawe and two different uh, types of songs there. <laughs> and she sort of asks, um, you know, uh, does anyone know how these styles have changed since the mid 1970s? Do we have any idea? Does anybody have any idea? You know, anybody in the room or, 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 or is this something that's known or not known? No, I, I never did an analysis of Sandawe. Um, I also worked with Burungay and Rangi. Um, what I was more aware of were the the crossovers and the correlations between organology. Um, some fascinating things going on there with instrument migration um, and symbolism in ceremonies, which I would love to research more, um, but that's that's another topic altogether, so I didn't cover it today. Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll do Helen's last written question. She says, this is a very vague question, but one thing I remember from the Sandawe songs is the overlapping of different voices in different ways. Do you have anything to say on that? Again, it, it depends on cultures. And um, I've just been discussing this with a student because she's working in the Solomon Islands and she says, um, she says they're not using call and response because uh, a solo voice will start and then the the, the group, the response group will start maybe a couple of beats immediately after that and overlap what she's doing. Or sometimes they wait four beats or they wait six beats. Sometimes they don't even come in. And when you're again transcribing this and trying to figure out what is the structure of that and why is that happening? And would you still call it call and response? Or is it simply a form of overlapping like you hear with Stephen Feld's work in Brazil? Um, where this particular culture group always, when somebody says something, the person that they're saying it to interrupts them and starts speaking. And he got so annoyed with this when he was doing language learning, he was, he was like, Mike, what's the matter with you guys? Am I, am I not getting any better? And then he noticed they did the same in their songs. One would start a song, the person around them would immediately start singing the same song, but just two beats or three beats or four beats later. It's like a little echo going on and they do the same in their speech. Um, so yeah, fascinating things to look at. Brilliant. Um, Julie, thank you so much um, for coming today and for uh, giving this talk. Before we finish, I just want to look ahead. Uh, our next webinar is on Wednesday, the 9th of March, and it's by uh, Rift Valley Network member Catherine Ranhorn. It's titled Salvaging Vanishing Art and Heritage with Community Collaborative Archaeology in Kondoa, Tanzania. Uh, and the full abstract will be in our next uh, newsletter. Talks are, of course, uh, available on uh, YouTube, and uh, this talk will be posted uh, as swiftly as possible uh, there for uh, you and our other members to enjoy.